Again, my name is Chris Porter, and I'm going to moderate this discussion with the two candidates for uh, King County Council District 8. I'd first like to introduce uh, current county council member, Teresa Mosqueda. <laughs> and the uh, current uh, mayor of Burien, Sophia Arrow. <laughs> So before I jump into the meaty questions, the first thing is yesterday at another <laughs> program I was at, I was introduced to the notion of the Seattle hot dog, which apparently is only hot dogs, um, hot dog in a bun, cream cheese, and caramelized onions. So I will say first, my first question to you is, um, in somewhere in District 8, what's your favorite food or place? <laughs> I'll start with... Um, this is a quick yes. In District 8, so why I would choose Tonki Migia in Burien. It's the delicious Vietnamese food. I thought your question at first was like yes or no yes to the uh, Seattle hot dog, and I was like yes, double thumbs up. Um, my favorite place to go with our family is Marination Station, and it's a fun place to go, rain or shine. Thank you so much. So the first question I'll start with you, Sophia, is <clears throat> Oh. oh, I'm sorry, I jumped to that. We'll start with opening statements, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sophia, please. So thank you, so I'm Sophia Aragon, and I'm the mayor of the city of Marion, and I'm running for King County District 8 because I want all county residents to thrive. And this means making sure King County is a safe, healthy, and inclusive place where families can call home and businesses can take root. So I grew up in South Seattle. My mom single-handedly supported our family of four, and with the union job, she had a living wage and health care. And my parents moved us actually to unincorporated King County for affordable housing because a safe neighborhood and good public schools was the goal. And like mom, I became a registered nurse. And one of the best jobs I ever had was working in a community clinic in the Rainier Valley. And there I chose to serve people who often spoke different languages, were immigrants, low income, and struggled with housing. And but nursing taught me to be an advocate for others and I decided to step up that skill and become an attorney to shape public policy and in Olympia I advocated for workplace safety health care for all and getting toxics out of our environment and so from my experience strong public policy creates opportunity and I want to create those conditions where everyone has a chance to succeed for example, as mayor, I know representation matters. As a woman of color and Asian immigrant, I took a stand on anti-Asian hate. And I support police and fire in a co-response model so that mental health crisis is not treated like a crime. And I work hard to collaborate with the county as a city in building affordable housing. And I voted for ARPA dollars to go towards supporting small businesses, expanding childcare, and apprenticeships that lead to careers. And I also try my hardest to promote respectful debate on city council so that we do the business of the people with mutual respect. So as King County Council member, I would focus on common safe public safety measures with adequate police presence, a healthy environment, and an affordable housing for all so that we all have the opportunity to prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa? Oh. <laughs> Teresa? Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to the 34th. Thank you for all the work you did. I know that there's been months of planning on these questions in this forum and the vote happening on the 14th. So excited to be here with you. My house is just four blocks away. It is exciting to have you all here in the neighborhood we call home. That's where my kiddo plays in all year long and that's the splash park that she goes to uh, for the, the waiting pool. My neighbors are here, hi Katie, and our old friends from the 34th who've seen me over the six years that I've now been in office. Thank you to the firefighters who turned out every time I ran for office and just called me yesterday to say that I was, in, that I was endorsed for King County Council. I got a call yesterday as well from Governor Inslee, who let us know that he was endorsing my race for King County Council. I bring this up to tell you about the long list of endorsements that I have from folks who are across our city and our state and right here in the 34th. Every 34th legislative district member, Senator Nguyen, Representative Fitzgibbon, Representative Alvarado, former uh, state senator Sharon Nelson, um, and our uh, Seattle City Council member Lisa Herbold, who's in the office here with us, uh, in the room here with us, along with Jan Drago, current and former council members, 
state legislators, the governor, King County Executive Dow Constantine. They have seen me in action, fighting to lift up worker protections, fighting for affordable housing and passing progressive revenue. That is the reason that I have broad endorsements across the spectrum. They know that I've done so much to invest in working families, but the reason I want to run for King County Council is to invest in our health. King County Council is the place to be to invest in public health and behavioral health, to address the shadow pandemic of increased substance abuse, mental health needs, isolation, and depression. We can do more at the county to invest in the health and well-being of our community members, and I want to be at the table to make sure that we're investing in health. And I'll continue my commitments to fighting for more affordable housing, addressing homelessness, and the workforce supports necessary so everyone has a good living wage job. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, I do want to backtrack and say I introduced you as a Tuesday as a county council member that should have been city of Seattle council member. I apologize for that. <clears throat> First question begins with for you, Sophia, is homelessness remains a crisis among King County and it has not yet been effectively addressed, including through sweeps and encampment relocations like those that have recently recently been used in Bureau. Oh, no. What new solutions will you offer on the council and or are sweeps an appropriate management tool across King County? Well, and Brierian has had a very recent um, emergency with homelessness. And when I say that, you know, honestly, people say, well, that's the same in my city, too. So you're absolutely right in that we have a ways to go to address this issue. And so for me, being so up close and personal, so we're a council that really is hands on on a lot of these issues. And we've all talked to social service providers. We've talked to our neighboring cities because when I ran four years ago, we talked about this as a regional issue. Because it is so large, no one city can stand alone. So one of the things that I realized in getting also to know the King County Regional Homelessness Authority is there is a really significant gap in emergency housing. Now in Burien over the last four years, we've promoted a good array of affordable housing, DESC, for example, for permanent supportive housing. Um, affordable cottages so people in, with um, modest incomes can actually grow equity. Habitat for Humanity, another um, equitable, equity growing choice. And then market rate and mixed housing, which is the connect part, part of building. And the closest one could be available is one year. You know, throwing a pandemic, labor shortages, you can have four years out. And it's been really apparent that we don't have the emergency housing to bring people inside so that we can understand what their needs are, help them navigate about where they need to go, and have that transitional place so they get services for substance use, if that's the case, services for mental health, if that's the case, or um, permanent housing. Teresa? Thank you so much. In terms of the solution to the most pressing crisis we see in our region, which is lack of access to housing, affordable housing, and the homelessness crisis, the solution is housing and health services. I have a track record of investing in additional housing, everything from affordable housing to permanent supportive housing, to investing in emergency housing, and with my colleague, RV safe lots and RV storage, the workers on the front line making sure that they can keep people safely housed. The solution is additional housing and emergency housing as we get people off the street. We know that when sweeps occur, it only re-harms or re-traumatizes people who may be using substances as a way for self-medication, who may have a mental health crisis that's going undiagnosed and untreated. But when sweeps occur, we know from human service providers, it is so incredibly hard to find those folks again get them into housing that becomes available. We know that they get um, further down the rabbit hole in terms of the health crises that they're facing, and human service providers tell us it is much harder to find people and get them off the street. The solution is getting people off the street. Now I understand that we are in a really tough time across our city, our region, and our nation when it comes to homelessness. But if I had the chance to work uh, with you all, I would vote to make sure that more people cannot get swept off the street because it's from a public harm perspective the wrong thing to do. And respectfully, in the city of Burien, I would have said yes to the county's $1 million offer to have a million dollars over the course of a year that could have invested in security and in bathrooms and the tiny house villages from pilot shelters. I vote for bathrooms, I vote for harm reduction, and I vote for getting people into the shelter. Well, thank you. The next question is for you, uh, Teresa. The King County 
um, regional homeless authority uh, that it was put in place four years ago to address homelessness in our region. The authority's progress has been questioned. Its five-year plan has been delayed, and its CEO recently stepped down. The authority is requesting more funding. <clears throat> As a council member, will you continue to support KCRHA? Um, Mark Drones said, and this was a quote from his letter of resignation, we must all commit to telling the whole truth, not just about the work now, but also how generations of systemic racism and oppression, decisions made by people in positions of power, brought us here. And he also additionally made a comment about staff dynamics when he said, I have watched them become bitter and destructive, and what I know is that I don't want that for myself. What is needed for your continued support? Thank you for the question. So I, along with my colleagues like Councilmember Herbold and Sally Bagshaw, I'm not sure if she's here, um, she said she was going to come. If we see her, we can applaud her for the efforts that we've collectively done to try to stand up the regional homelessness authority. This is a regional crisis. Obviously, homelessness does not stop at Seattle's border. It is a regional issue that needs additional buy-in. The city of Seattle, as I've been budget chair, has been the largest contributor to supporting the Regional Homelessness Authority. At King County Council, I will continue to support the Regional Homelessness Authority to make sure that they have the investments not only to stand up emergency shelter, uh, emergency housing, but to invest in the workforce. The workforce from folks like Southwest Youth and Family Services to youth care to DESC, um, they talk about how they have incredible turnover rates. And my colleagues and I have been on the front line to make sure that we're investing in their wages. When they have 40 to 60% turnover rates and the year that I came into office had not received a cost of living increase in 10 years, it is no wonder that we're losing people through the gaps. It's no wonder that we're losing people that are cycling back into homelessness. So I appreciate that um, Mark Dones had made an investment in the wages. I wanna see wages invested in at not only RHA, but the community partners as well, so that our safety net is strong, that we have the workforce necessary and the trusted relationships to get people off of the street and that we have the infrastructure from uh, tiny houses, tiny houses, tiny houses, to emergency housing and affordable housing. I will be your person to invest across the income spectrum and into workers. Sophia. Okay. Thank you. Well, and I, I've been fortunate to work um, closely with Mark Jones in our situation in Burien, and I do support an organization or entity where there is a focus on homelessness, where we can have the data available in terms of informing what strategies we can take, and also the willingness to coordinate, coordinate between the cities as well as county entities that are all involved in homelessness. <coughs> For example, uh, we had great conversations around sanctioned encampments and he says you know the data does not show that sanctioned encampments have good outcomes and from that that's where Burien is committed to finding stable housing or treatment for those people and not letting them stay in an encampment knowing that from the experience of that agency and the data they have that that's not the solution and also in this experience of ours that we've seen many gaps um, the county entities such as REACH or LEAD are very under-resourced and it's come to light that so many organizations, nonprofits, Chief Seattle being one of them, are at the table and there needs to be better coordination to knit them together so that they can all work together and work more effectively to serve those needs of people unhoused. Thank you. Um, and I want to go to a one minute follow-up. Um, I want to go back to this portion of Mark Drone's comments on whether or not <clears throat> the Housing Authority has really addressed some of the root causes of what's going on. He spoke again, I think to use his words, about telling the whole truth, not just the work now, but also how generations of systemic racism and oppression, decisions made by people in power positions brought us to here. And um, to the degree that that's impacting the effectiveness of the um, authority. And I'll, I'll uh, go to you. Teresa for a minute, and then back to you, Sophie. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. 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 Should I restart? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the follow-up. I think this is an important element, and I don't want to miss this part of your question either. Systemic racism is absolutely part of the reason that we continue to see people fall into homelessness. It is also absolutely part of the reason that we see such low pay in human service providers, and it is part of the reason as well that we continue to see investments historically 
be back burner for homeless investments. Why? Because the majority, disproportionately, the, there is a disproportionate number of people of color who are homeless. There's a disproportionate number of people of color who are serving as homeless service providers. And because of redlining and racist covenants and restrictive lending policies, we have not been able to build generational wealth and home ownership opportunities for folks of color. That is why housing instability is so prevalent amongst community of color, communities of color. That is why rent escalating costs affect disproportionately people of color higher. And that is where you see people fall into homelessness. It all ties back to racist roots and public policy. Sophie. That's an excellent question. And when we are, um, we're addressing needs of unhoused people, they're really at some point of a, an end point or a crisis point in their lives. And we really have to think about what are those factors that put them there? So what are those things can we do to support people so that they have the ability to live their fullest potential, to support themselves and their families? And that does go back to education. That goes back to jobs. And often I teach about public health um, as a registered nurse, and the things that drive how long someone lives and your quality of life, if you think about it, 70% are those community conditions, one of them being community safety. 30% are those healthy behaviors, one of those is substance use. I only can impact 20% as a clinician. Housing, transportation, that's only 10%. So I really appreciate his comment that we need to look back at how well are we doing in these root causes that not just cause homelessness, but necessary for everyone to thrive. Thank you. Uh, Sophia, the next question uh, begins with you. Housing is increasingly unaffordable. Listen we just briefly talked about in King County. What changes have been made, have, what changes have and must be made to create more low income and workforce housing for those earning less than $20 per hour, given that the mean cost of a house in King County is $802,000? Yeah, it's quite amazing. I just looked at my parents' home that they bought in South Seattle for $30,000. Hasn't changed much and now it's $950,000 just kind of blows your mind. Um, so there, I think there has been a lot of progress in terms of uh, standing up affordable housing. In Buren, we've done four models. We know that affordable housing and having a home is actually a part of growing generational wealth. So you have Habitat, Humanity, and EcoThrive. Those are both equity building um, strategies for low-income people. And we also have permanent supportive housing. And we also have mixed uh, market and low rate housing um, so that we can have those models actually stand up faster. And there's also current re legislation that now that we're in our comprehensive plan as a city, which is one of the most important efforts a city can make, is maximizing the use of the land that we have so that we can have two houses instead of one house, three houses instead of one house on the lot, depending on its closeness to transportation. So those are the things that um, we're hoping to invest in to increase access and affordability. But there is more, I think, to go. Do you mind repeating the question? Sure. Uh, housing is increasingly unaffordable in King County. What changes have been made, what changes have and must be made to create more low income and workforce housing for those earning less than $20 per hour, given that the mean cost of a house in King County is $802,000? Thank you so much. So even before the pandemic, in 2019, we saw that over two-thirds of King County households... We're just, we're just okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we saw that more than two-thirds of King County households were struggling to be able to afford their mortgage or their rent, meaning they were paying more than 30% of their income on housing. This is a crisis. We need to be investing in affordable housing and housing across the income spectrum for more people to be able to live near the place of their employment. I talked to a small business owner up on California and I asked them, a small business owner, if I had a magic wand, what is the number one thing that you would want me to do? And he looked at the empty parking lot across the street on California and said, if that parking lot was instead housing with childcare on the first floor, my workers wouldn't be so stressed out about getting home on time my workers would be able to know that they could pick their kiddo up on time. The number one thing that we need to be doing is invest in more affordable housing, zero to 30% of the area median income, because the market is not picking that up. Zero to 50% of area median income would be ideal, because the market's not picking that up either. 
And then as we create more incentives for people to stay in place, especially as small business, or as, um, as elders and low income workers, we need to also be making sure that we're creating opportunities, incentives for people who have a home currently to divide it if they want to have shared housing with the other family members and with members of the community. We can do that through incentives at the county for building denser, and that supports our business as well. That's okay. <laughs> Oh, I see there was multiple. Yes. <laughs> this question is for you, uh, Teresa, to start. Seattle, Tukwila, SeaTac have increased the minimum wage above the state wide minimum wage of $15.74 per hour. What do you believe the minimum wage should be in King County, including unincorporated King County, and why, you, and why do you believe it should be that? Also, states like New York, Massachusetts, and California are pushing to have the minimum wage to start at $20 per hour, given that at $20 an hour, that is $41,000 a year. Well, thank you so much for this question. Folks probably know that I work for the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, for um, over seven years. And while I was there, we led the efforts on minimum wage and sick leave initiative, Initiative 1433, that overwhelmingly won by Washington State voters. We worked for years to help make that a reality because the Washington State Legislature couldn't pass it, but you all did. I have the track record of not only working with small businesses and working families and the community at large to support increases in the minimum wage, I have the, uh, we have the proof in the pudding that when we invest in good living wage jobs in the increase in the minimum wage, it supports our small businesses, it supports the health of the local economy, and it supports the health of the population as well. While King County doesn't have the jurisdiction necessarily to increase the minimum wage for all residents across the county because we rely on local jurisdictions to make those jurisdiction by city by city decisions, what I would want to do is make sure that we're investing in good economic opportunities for all. District 8 is home to ATU, home to iron workers, home, uh, home to MLK Labor Hiring Hall, home to um, so many different unions across District 8. We can make this the economic hub so that more people can get access to a good union job. And then the county, I'm looking at 1199 up there, the county should be a good employer to recruit more people into things like public health, good nursing jobs across our county, make sure that we're investing in higher wages, but also for workers of color who were hardest hit by the pandemic and should be first in line to get access to these good jobs. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. I wholeheartedly believe we need to secure a living wage for everyone and this goes to the point that you brought up is affordability is a huge issue in our county. And I think everyone needs to be at the table when we talk about this. Um, for example, Burien is a majority small business um, community, over 6,000 businesses. We don't have any major corporations. And that's just something that needs to be considered when we get to the table and we tell each other, we have a goal to reach to make sure we have a livable, women, livable wage. And what needs to be considered to get there? And what are those strategies to get there? Whether it's a, a staggered system, step by step over time. But I agree that we do need to have a livable living wage for everyone. If, just a quick follow up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> follow up, yeah. <laughs> I still wanted to say, and, and I appreciate your comments, mm -hmm. that the county does have a direct jurisdiction over dollars per hour paid uh, for employment. But in the ideal world, if you could advocate for that, what would that wage per hour be and why? Uh, for, yeah, I absolutely support the efforts that are taking place right now to get the minimum wage closer to $20 an hour. I also think that's in line and slightly higher than what Seattle is paying, but it's still not enough. The minimum wage at uh, the current level is not keeping up with the cost of inflation. I believe, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that if we were closer to paying a minimum wage that could actually meet our minimum obligations, we'd be closer to about $35 an hour. I might be wrong on that, um, but that is what I think should be, uh, we should be held accountable to. When the minimum wage was set into statute, we should have been keeping up with the um, CPI, the um, Consumer Price Index. That's what I included in Initiative 1433 that you all supported so that there would be escalated um, um, 
uh, enhancements to the minimum wage. I think that we should look at what the actual minimum is right now, which I believe is closer to $35 an hour, and try to achieve that. But I absolutely support the call from Transit Writers Union and so many others to increase the minimum wage across our region to, air, to about $20, $20 an hour right now. Thank you, Sophia. Well, and I think it's a great question in terms of what's the county's role um, due to unincorporated areas, because often that's where the inequities are on these unincorporated areas, because they have one less advocate, meaning they're not a municipality that can really advocate for um, livable wage. And as an employer, I'm running a nonprofit as an executive director. Um, there's been incredible inflation, and I'm committed to making sure that my employees are paid a rate that keeps up with the cost of living in King County. And I appreciate the unions, such as the transit unions, coming to city council and giving us some thorough education about their experience in um, working with other communities to adopt the minimum wage. So that's definitely a conversation um, right now that we're focusing on on Bureau and city council. And um, we'll, make, we'll be making a decision on that um, for our community by the end of the summer. And the county, just one more thing, you know, like many entities, could be a trendsetter in terms of what um, is a livable wage, and that's something that the county can play. Thank you. Uh, Sophia, this next question begins with you. On Tuesday, uh, this past Tuesday, school, the Seattle Council, City Council voted five to four against the measure to give the city attorney authority to prosecute drug possession and public use in public usage. Council Member Mosqueda voted against the measure. The county uh, prosecutor's office has said they do not want to prosecute these cases. How should drug possession and public usage be addressed? And that's for me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, and I've had conversations among what's called the Sound Cities Associations, which includes Seattle, but it's really all of the cities um, in the King County. And we've had discussions for over the year and intensified during legislative session about what to do with the Blake decision. Um, and one of the things I agreed with actually with King County leaders is that we want a uniform, we want a uniform policy across the state. Um, it, is a, um, it is inefficient and creates gaps when one entity is different from all the other entities in King County, particularly when it comes to public safety, because why should residents expect anything less in one jurisdiction from another? So I think it's really important to work together and strive for that state standard. And as I mentioned before, community safety is part of a package of things that really impacts people's quality of life and length of life. And so, and also, um, public safety is one of those things that is the responsibility of local government in which, in addition to public health, we need to address both those things, and often we have to balance those things, but that's our job. It's not an easy job, but that's something we must do. And then finally, I know that there are different opinions around um, the use of penalties or sanctions around drug use, but we need to do everything we can to address this epidemic because it has now surpassed COVID-19. Thank you. Teresa? Uh, thanks so much. I mean, I think the thing to underscore is that there should be unanimity across the state. That's why the state legislature passed the law. The state legislature had to codify something in the wake of the Blake decision. It did not require cities to pass something that required cities to mirror what happened at the state law. I want to be really clear about that. And my colleagues, I think, were very clear on the dais. It is not standard, routine, or mandated that the city council immediately codify a change in RCW, especially related to gross misdemeanors. There's three examples in recent history where the state legislature has created a new gross misdemeanor and the city council did not immediately have to act to impl implement it because we're not required to. The important part here is to make sure that we're having a conversation with King County and the King County Prosecutor's Office about what resources they may need to continue to prosecute misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors as they've done since 2021. The important thing that we should also be underscoring is that uh, we have more return on our investment, healthier return on our investment when we treat addiction as the public health crisis that it is. I want the city of Seattle to be investing in early and upstream investments so that we can help people get off of substances and get them into a healthier place. 
but the county prosecutor still has jurisdiction to prosecute open consumption because of the state legislation. There's a misunderstanding out there that we had to do it. We did not. And I have a follow-up too, if you're right. <laughs> I happen to have a follow-up on that one, which is um, <clears throat> when then city attorney Pete Wilson, Holmes, Pete Wilson's ex of California, Holmes, um, was city attorney, he put out a statement that, the, that his office would not prosecute low possession of marijuana. This says the state laws were changed. And the tickets that, and so the information went out that police officers would not ticket for that. Those numbers dropped drastically, but the lion's share of the remaining tickets still went to black and brown folks mm -hmm. in the city of Seattle. Does it concern you that it is so easy to see these changes and knowing that we still have a history of when changes like this come into play, it still disproportionately impacts black and brown people? I'll start with you, Sophia, one minute. Well, and that's a great comment because we're no longer talking about just what happens when officers um, are in the situation when it is a drug possession. We're talking about bias, bias in the system. And me and work, health workforce development, we've been steep in this as well because it happened during COVID. We had certain populations that got sicker and died at a more rapid rate, even though they got the same public health services. Well, why is that? Because there's bias in the system. So we have to work as a county to root out what that bias is. Education for officers as well as the public and also have more accountability measures so that we can see hopefully over time that that bias decreases because it's certainly still a problem and that's something that applies to anything that public safety does. Thank you. Well, I think that the reason that I voted no is precisely because of the disproportionate impact on folks of color. The disproportionate data that shows that when we arrest people, it does not lead to sobriety. And especially with the fentanyl crisis, arrests are not equaling people getting sober. Arrests are equaling people overdosing and dying at higher rates. And to your point around the disproportionate impact on people of color, you know, addiction affects folks who are housed and unhoused. It affects people at all income levels. It affects people of all races and ethnicities. But what the legislation was intended to do from Ann Davidson was actually just target open public consumption. And given what we've talked about, about the higher rates of folks of color being more likely to live outside, it is absolutely true that this legislation would have only exacerbated that racial bias and that disproportionate impact on folks of color. We need solutions to the crisis of overdose and public use. Our firefighters see it every day. I talked to President Stewart about this yesterday. But the solution is in harm reduction and trying to have a collaborative effort with King County, not something forced down our throat. Thank you. Um, this question goes back to you, uh, Teresa. What is your biggest environmental concern for King County, and how will you address the reality of the disproportionate impact of climate change on BIPOC communities? Well, thank you so much, and I know our 33rd and 34th um, Environmental Caucus um, members here today appreciate having an environmental justice question included in here. The largest contributor to carbon emissions is CO2 gas from cars. Single occupancy vehicles are our largest polluters. My interest in creating affordable housing near where people work, near their place of employment and their childcare and their senior center is making sure that fewer people are using their vehicles simply to get to work. We can do this by creating denser opportunities, incentivizing local jurisdictions, and working with the unincorporated areas like White Center and Vashon Murray <coughs> Island to be able to build faster, build more affordable, and build greener. I'm first focused on building affordable housing near our places of employment. Second, I want more people to leave their cars at home. Having been on Vashon Murray Island repeatedly since I ran for office, I know how difficult it is to get back and forth on the ferry with your vehicle, but there's not a metro small bus that can just pick you up and have a shuttle from the ferry up to places of economic opportunity. We need to do that not only to increase tourism and opportunity for people on the island to keep their small business open, we need to do that so that more people can come and visit Vashon, go around our beautiful district without having to use a car, and that will be good for workers who also need to come in and out of the ferry. I want to increase access to the water taxi as well, making sure that it's um, uh, throughout the day and not just at peak hours for both Vashon and to have that regularly for West Seattle as well. It's streamlining our transportation and increasing access to housing. Thank you. Sophia? Thank you. 
Um, I'm proud that Burien was one of the first cities to pass a climate action plan. Um, and we have been orienting our efforts to make sure that we reach the, climate, the goals by 2050. And the solutions could be multifaceted. For us, when we look at our data, the carbon emissions actually come from homes. And so what we've done is to um, prioritize funding available um, to give people the opportunity to modernize our homes. We have a great community of um, mid-century homes and they could learn and use heat pumps better, for example. Um, I certainly agree with transportation and that we also um, uh, promote elect electric cars um, in the city of Burien. And in working with the county, we have our rapid ride H line that streams line travel between up and down Burien and Seattle, basically the entire 8th district. Um, the other piece for me um, as a, a, a leader in Burien is really understanding the impact of the environment on human health. And that's what means, that's what's closest to my interest as a nurse. So the city of Burien is an airport committee. Um, I'm sorry, airport community or airport city under FAA, the majority of people of color live just 10 miles within the radius of SeaTac Airport, the eighth largest airport in the country. And we have to be cognizant about the impact to not just people of color, but everyone who lives that close to the airport. So that's why we have preserved green spaces, have tree ordinance, knowing that that natural greenery helps absorb that CO2. Thank you. So this is our last question uh, before we wrap it up and do closing statements. And the last question, uh, we'll start with you, Sophia. What do you believe the public health department needs to do to prepare for the next pandemic? King County is facing a budget shortfall and cuts to public health seem unavoidable. Okay. Well, and being the mayor of the city of Burien, um, I've had an up close and personal um, experience with COVID-19 as a smaller city of 52,000 people. Uh, the data that shows how we're impacted and data available to show what kind of strategies we need specifically for our communities were often buried under Seattle and Bellevue and those largest jurisdictions. So I really push to make sure that we have data for all communities so that they can see how they're affected um, and whether or not their strategies work and which strategies to choose. For example, pop-up clinics became really important for us when it was really clear that not everybody's gonna make it over to our stadiums, right, for those, for those vaccine shots. I also serve, because I brought up my concerns, um, the Association of Washington Cities, and I serve on the Governor's Public Health Advisory Board. For the first time, a city representative has been invited to a statewide public health forum knowing that they need different voices. And I keep pushing over and over again that these pop there's certain populations were affected heavily, given our current public health system, Hispanics two or three times died or hospitalized more. Same with African American. And then Pacific Islanders were third. And we need to just look really hard. When we talk about public health as a system that promotes equity, equity, it's clearly not there. And it's been my mission to make sure that we root out what are those things that we are causing so that we have these kind of inequitable health outcomes. Thank you. Teresa. Okay, thank you for this question. I love this. This gets back to the roots. I started at um, Seymour Community Health Centers, Department of Health, Community Health Network of Washington, Children's Alliance. Getting back to the health roots is why I do public policy. I am committed to investing in our population's health and individual health. Regarding public health, there has never been a time when we have seen the divestment from public health so evident as during a global pandemic. But we were on the front line across this globe, thanks to Governor Inslee and Executive Constantine for their leadership. We actually were able to show the country what it looks like to have a footprint of public health in community in partnership with our community health centers and federally qualified health centers. We had made investments in an actual footprint, uh, whether it was a mobile clinic or investments in brick and mortar co-located uh, with our community health clinics. We know that that model actually served us very well because we were able to continue to serve the community with trusted community partners who looked like the community that they were serving. I will do three things. Invest in additional direct support to expand the footprint of public health Seattle King County by co-location models or mobile clinics and scale that up so that we have more on the ground services that come directly from public health 
so that no matter how business models change for our clinics in the future years, we always have that. Number two, scale up the number of people coming to public health as a good living wage job and focus on recruiting folks of color, black and brown folks, so that we can actually address the disproportionate impact on folks of color um, in maternal mortality and child mortality. And three, funding. I want a public health um, benefit district. Thank you so much. I want to thank both of you for your very thoughtful responses to these questions and the uh, participating audience. Um, closing statements will begin with uh, you, Sophia. Thank you so much, and I think that you've answered some or asked some really key questions here in this race that applies to everybody running for office. It doesn't matter what level you're in. And it's been my lived experience. I never mentioned the unincorporated area that my family moved to um, when they looked for affordable housing. Um, it didn't have a name then, but now it is actually modern day Issaquah and Sammamish. And what I'd like to say is that from that experience, the presence of the county, its engagement, and its investment can really determine whether a community thrives or just simply survives. And that's the importance of county. It's an invisible infrastructure that we need to make sure we strengthen so that all communities in King County thrive. And just to emphasize again, the sole role of, of local government is public safety and public health. And also prevention as well, and that obtains the opioid crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you again for hosting us at the 34th members. Uh, you are strong and mighty. It's exciting to be back with you again. I'm asking for your support to move from Seattle City Council to King County Council, to be able to be at the table and directly invest in our community health, in public health and substance abuse issues and behavioral health needs to be at the table to invest in the shadow pandemic that has only been exacerbated and worsened by the COVID crisis. This is my commitment to you. Every single piece of public policy that comes across King County Council's desk, I will continue to prioritize the social determinants of health, making sure our community have, has access to affordable housing and adequate housing, that our seniors can stay in the home if they prefer or have access to congregate meals and more affordable housing options for them. That our small businesses have economic resilience and they have workers available at their fingertips to invest in their local economy. And that workers have good living wage jobs, whether it's in a union or across our county. I'm your champion for the social determinants of health. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's all give a round of applause for our candidate, Julie Bayer, Sophia Aragon, and 